All right. Good morning, everybody. How you guys doing today? Everybody good? We love it. My name is Rodney. I am the owner of Garden 17. If we have not had the pleasure to meet, nice to meet you guys. Uh, today we are going to talk about our summer lawn and how to prep our summer lawn. Uh, we will run through a couple of you know, common things that we see and common questions that we get. We'll also talk today a little bit about some turf alternative options um, as a good way to go, especially if you are uh, fed up with battling that summer lawn kind of thing, right? So we'll talk through all those as well. Uh, just as a quick reminder, this class is for you guys, so please do not hesitate to ask any questions. If you have to, run to the restroom, out the door, straight to the right. You won't miss it. And of course, feel free to refill your coffees and teas as we go today. Um, oh, real quick too, is the fan too high? Is that okay for everybody? All right, cool. I was just trying to keep it as, yes, all right, cool, right. I figured we'd all be on the same page. Just wanna be sure. Uh, overview today, we're just gonna hit on the importance of aeration, removing thatch buildup, importance of compost, supplements, hot water, uh, and turf is just a label, right? That's gonna be our turf alternatives that we'll talk about today. Um, but that's gonna be kind of our overview that we'll hit on. And like I said, if you guys have any questions of anything that we are not covering, by all means, please ask, right? Um, but that'll be a, kind of the goal. So to jump right in, we'll start with aeration. And we're gonna talk about these steps in the, uh, the order of operations that you would do in the lawn, okay? So when we think about our summer lawn, uh, we are worried about things like, is it healthy and is it getting enough water, right? Those are our two big things that we tend to see. We'll touch on the idea of brown patch and such as well. We typically see that in a wet spring like we've been getting, thankfully, knock on wood, that keeps continuing, right? Um, but the idea here is that we're gonna touch on all the, the big basics of how to make sure our lawn is uh, maintaining its health, basically. So when we talk about aeration, what we're talking about is getting air circul circulation into the soil, okay? So the idea of aeration, and this is just a hand tool, this is the most common one that you can pick up at most garden centers kind of thing, but the idea that this guy's doing is it is gonna remove two plugs at a time. And plugs are just those little cylinder shapes that we're gonna be basically removing out of the lawn as we go, right? We're gonna take that right out of the soil. And the idea here that we're gonna see is that we're gonna make literal holes into the lawn and into the root depth space, right? So the aeration, what it's doing is helping get oxygen down into that soil. Most common problem with the lawn is the lawn is grown as a ground cover, right? So as it continues to grow, it's gonna kind of bury and suffocate itself in that way. And it's going to basically reduce the amount of airflow that can get to the soil by doing so, right? So because the, the lawn loves to be cut, we're mowing our lawns constantly, it loves that, so it's growing more and more. So it's basically just layering on itself. So the idea would be to get this, um, this aeration in, into the space and help the soil get some oxygen. The other thing that aeration is going to do is it's also gonna allow water back to where it needs to go. When we water uh, most of our plants in the landscape, we're often aiming very low to the soil because most of the foliage is up top, right? So if we've got foliage up top, we're often aiming for the soil level. The problem with our lawn is we can't really do that, right? We can't get to the soil level with the lawn. And so what happens is that water's gonna build up in that growth and that growth is called thatch. That's kind of this layer here, this little graphic I found online, I'm, I'm in love with it because it's so simple to see, right? But the idea here is this thatch layer is that kind of layer where it's layering on top after season after season of new growth coming through. And that thatch layer is kind of the dead stuff or the decaying plant material. We typically blow out our garden beds or rake out the leaves every season, right? We can't really do that in the lawn. And so it's not as easy to remove that thatch layer. So we'll talk about thatch buildup as well in depth. But the idea with the aeration is to kind of penetrate through that layer to get us to the soil level, right? And so we want it, once we're down in that soil level, we can now get back into getting oxygen and getting water to where it needs to go. Watering from overhead is probably the worst way we can water most of our plants, but it is basically the only way we can water lawn, right? So that thatch area in the lack of sunlight getting to the soil is also harboring a lot of disease and fungus, right? So the more uh, aeration in uh, air we can get into the soil, by aeration, excuse me, uh, the better off the health of the grass will be, right? We wanna kind of dry that layer out, basically. Thatch buildup. So we see this awesome graphic again. <laughs> but basically the idea here in thatch is this is our new growth. Thatch is gonna be kind of that, like I said, that kind of dead foliage layer, right? You often see um, St. Augustine is a great uh, example of that. Does anybody have St. Augustine lawn? Yeah, awesome. 
Cool. So St. Augustine with that big broad leaf, as the new growth comes out, it's kind of hiding the layer underneath. And the next year hides that, hides that, hides that. And that little bit layer tends to build up, right? This is a really good photo to show the idea of what soil in a healthy grass should look like. We notice our blades are able to go straight to the soil here. In this example, this here is the soil. That's all thatch, right? Basically, all that is is composting leaf debris building up, right? So what happens in that layer is that's where all the unhealthy things happen, the fungal and the diseases and such, right? The other problem with a thatch layer is because it's not truly a soil layer, it's not letting water penetrate to the root system. And so what happens is our roots on our turf grass get shorter and shorter and shorter because our water's not penetrating as deeply anymore, right? In thatch buildup, there's a couple of really easy, way, uh, easy ways excuse me, to remove that layer. I personally go through my lawn because I have a very small section of lawn. I have purposefully gotten rid of most of my lawn, uh, but I do have a small section of lawn and I just take a, a soft leaf rake, right? Soft tine leaf rake and just do a quick little like scratches at the surface, right? Typically want to do that before it starts getting too warm. So thankfully this year, we're getting a little bit cooler than we uh, normally do. If we remember last year was already like 105 this time of year. Uh, we can take that leaf rake and we can kind of scratch that layer and remove that debris. If you've never done this in a lawn before, it is always shocking the amount of debris you will remove in a very small section, okay? So St. Aug again is a great example of that. Bermuda is another. Uh, zoysia, if you use like a Palisades zoysia with a broader leaf lawn, that's, you're, gonna, you're gonna have that same thatch layer build up. Now thatch builds up just over time, right? It is something that you can do every single year to have the most perfect lawn. I typically, because I'm doing mine by hand, I'm gonna do mine every other year usually. Um, but again, I am someone who's removing most of my lawn. So it just depends on what kind of level you want that lawn to be at. Yes, ma'am. Yes, um, yes. So Fun challenges. <laughs> Yep. Was it? Did you? Is it new last year, or it was, was it? It was like past. Like okay. Like, like maybe half of it was like existing, and then we added, added to it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Any new lawn is going to benefit from as much thatching as you can do. Now there are uh, what they call like thatching, what do they call it? Thatch removing machines, basically. It kind of looks like a sod cutting machine. It looks like an oversized push lawnmower, basically. Um, I wouldn't recommend those on a new lawn. I would definitely go the leaf rake route because it's gonna be a little bit softer to the root system, right? We don't wanna scratch the surface so hard when we're removing that thatch layer to be digging into the soil, right? We wanna just kind of hit that top layer, which is why those like soft tine rakes for leaf rake work really well too. Uh, but yeah, any, any new lawn is going to benefit it. Basically, your goal is get as much sunlight and water and air to the soil you can, right? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. 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 Yep. It would be, and we're going to talk about that on the next slide, actually. Yep. Um, so the other thing with thatch, again, is that it's suffocating the lawn. If you guys, has anybody ever potted or planted a plant in their life? All right, cool. <laughs> just checking, you know, we never know. We're just checking. Uh, <laughs> but our goal, whenever we plant or pot a plant, we know that we want our soil level to be the existing soil level of a root ball, right? We don't build up the soil on our stalks or our branches because that's where things like rot, fungal, and all of this come from, right? The same goes for the lawn. Every blade or every shoot is basically a branch. And so the more this thatch builds up, the more likely you are going to have a sick or unhealthy lawn that is just constantly thirsty and constantly struggling to be nice and lush, right? So you wanna basically prevent as much thatch buildup as you can. So once we have gotten the thatch out, that's when we get into our compost. So a lot of folks will go a topsoil route. I'm not a huge fan of the topsoil because there's a lot of loam content in a topsoil typically. There are different types out there. So as long as it's got a good, at least 50% mixture of compost, I would be a fan of it. The problem with loam in our area is our soils are so um, dense with a really heavy clay content, right? So if you think about putting 
the clay on top of clay, you're kind of making a cement uh, basically once you water it in. So I'm a bigger fan of like a compost. Um, and in this case, I would use something like a double or triple screen compost, they call it, something that's fine. Uh, in texture. Normally, planting our trees, shrubs, and perennials, we want as chunky of a compost as we can get because that helps bring air into the surface, right, or into the soils. Uh, but when we're top dressing like this, we really want to use something that's finer screened because, again, thinking about all of our lawn branching out, we want to be able to get it down to that soil level as best we can, okay? I just kind of showed a one, two, three process here. Uh, we, our landscape company stole some photos, but yeah, basically it's kind of a one, two, three process here. And so usually easiest way, shovel it, right? Use a shovel and kind of shake the shovel as you're dropping it out. So you don't have any areas that are too, too thick. I would recommend a push broom, right? Just a big push broom, one of those big 24 or 32 inch wide push brooms, industrial style, and literally work it into the lawn. You're trying to, once you bury the compost on top of the grass blades, you're trying to work it in so that those grass blades are sticking back up again, right? We want them to get as much sunlight as possible. And so at the end here, we have a big old machine we're using in this example, in this photo, right, that's helping us spread the compost. But at the end, this should be your, your general view. We don't want the compost to finish thick like this in any areas because we will cause burn, right? That will basically dot, kill off that, that part of the grass. We want it to be nice and thin and even as we possibly can get it like this so that we're still seeing all of the lawn blades pop through like that. So in a new lawn, um, how you mentioned you did the sod last year, a thinner layer of compost would be even better. So you may not even see any compost at all, right? Because that root layer is still pretty fragile and the compost, think of it as like a concentrate, right? It can cause a little bit of burn on a new lawn. So that, that root layer is really sensitive still. But yeah, basically here, in this photo, uh, you can kind of see some of the loose thatch still built up. I would have cleaned this, this St. Aug up a little bit more before putting my compost out. But then we're here, we're going to broom it out, right? And that's where it's going to start looking really, really thick. But as we keep working back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, we're going to get back to an aesthetic that looks like this. We're, we're holding those grass blades back up again. It is really good to mow the lawn before you remove your thatch, before you put your compost down. And the reason for that is you're gonna be dealing with less foliage at the time of getting this all broomed in and swept in, right? The aeration, if we go back to the first slide, that aeration, when we do those aeration uh, plugs, we're removing those sections of lawn, right? When we put in our compost, it's now gonna be able to fall into these holes that we just created, which is what we want because that compost is what's gonna help feed that soil. Most aerators are going to do anywhere from about an inch to two inches, depending, right? And that's just enough for most of our lawns. So things like uh, zoysias, actually I'm going to exclude zoysias, I'm going to put zoysias and bermudas together, but same, things like our St. Aug lawn are usually only two to three inches deep. They're very shallow root systems, right? So an aeration like that is really helpful. The reason that the city likes Bermuda and they're also pushing the zoysia is because the root systems are much deeper, not quite as deep as a buffalo grass or a... Um, can't think of the blend right now with the Ladybird Johnson Center, but it will come to me in a second. They make a, a seed blend that we like using a lot. Habiturf. Habiturf has got a lot of native grasses in it, and those, those root systems are closer to like eight to nine inches deep, right? Um, but the deeper the root system, the taller the grass wants to be. So you do have kind of a trade-off there, meaning the St. Augs, we can keep them really, really tight and really, really low. Whereas when we get into things like the buffaloes and the habiturfs, um, even some zoysias, to be honest, they want to be mowed more like three to four inches tall versus the one and a half to two inches tall, right? So you want to kind of keep an eye on those. Buffalo, actually, sorry, let me exclude buffalo from that. Buffalo wants to be longer than that. But the idea here is if we get a mow, we can get as close to the soil as possible. Yes, ma'am? I'm jumping back in one second. Please. Sorry. Not typically, no, because you're, you're pulling it with a rake. Yeah, it's, yeah, not typically. Those steps honestly could be totally interchangeable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, not typically. You don't have to worry about too, too much buildup there. Again, if we, um, let me jump back to that slide with that little graphic here. You can see you're going to be puncturing through that, that layer anyways, right? Um, now, if, you're, if you were to move in a home, um, my house is a, a built in 61 or 62. I'm not sure anybody's ever taken out the thatch of the front sand on the scene. Yep, yeah, okay, cool. So when you do it the first time, it might not be a bad idea to do the thatch first, just so you can 
find where the soil level even is, right? Um, because that thatch layer can be, uh, you know, an inch to two inches thick. And so if you're only using a, an aerator that's only going an inch to two inches deep, right, you're not really penetrating that soil level yet. Um, but if you're doing it, you know, next year, you could totally aerate and then do your thatching and such. Cool. So in the compost too, as it's falling into those little holes we've created, right, it's also helping break down that soil. So it's bringing oxygen naturally back into the soil texture. Um, what I usually always tell people is there's always more air that we want in our soil than we naturally think. At least 25%. That's quite a bit of air in soil, right? So we want soil to have a really good texture as best we can get it. This, the compost too, once you've done your spread, I usually recommend try to hit it with a rain if you can because that's gonna be like primo for it. But if you can't, do a watering afterwards, right? Let that compost juices, if you will, right? Just soak right into the soil because that's where you're gonna get the most effect out of your compost. This time of year, as we're getting into summer and we're getting our lawn prepped for summer, <clears throat> compost can dry out pretty quickly and it can lose a lot of its benefit, right? So you wanna utilize that to the best of your ability. So once you've got it aerated, you've got your thatch out, you're putting in your compost, do a good watering afterwards, right? Um, compost can be done two ways, depending on how, you're big, how big your uh, like lawn space is. Of course, we've got bags and we'll talk about the different brands and such in just a second. Um, you can do it banked, uh, which, a lot more control over that, right? You're not having to wheelbarrow, um, or you can do bulk, right? Bulk soils, where it's gonna be dumped in a big old dump truck, and then you can run it wheelbarrow style that way as well, right? So there's two applications, again, kind of depending on how lar large your lawn space is. Most of the time what I tell people is don't get overwhelmed with the lawn, especially if you've got a big lawn, do a section at a time, right? Um, it doesn't have to be done all at the same time. That's one nice thing about treating the lawn in that way. Uh, if you're not treating for like a fungal or a disease and you're just getting it prepped and ready, you got a three day weekend this weekend, right? Do a big section or do the front or do the back, that kind of thing. Try to break it up so it's not too overwhelming and powering on you. But that would be the ideas. Use that big broom, right? I think you can get a broom, what, 20 bucks or something out of Lowe's kind of concept, right? And then really broom that into the surface. You wanna, like I said, biggest thing with compost, work it in. Once you think you're done, take a 10 minute break, get some water and come back and do it again because I guarantee you, you can get it deeper kind of thing, right? Um, compost also activates the soil. So we're talking about how it adds that oxygen in there. So when compost is activating, or is most activating, I should say, is when we can help supplement uh, our lawn, right? So when we look at supplements, once your compost is in, we want the most bang for the buck out of that moment, right? Because we've just broke a sweat doing all that work. We want it to be beautiful, right? So supplements are really gonna be where that's helpful. And we're gonna, I've got mostly the liquids up there because I will say I'm a little bit of an impatient gardener. Um, I like results and I like them fast, right? But liquids are always gonna be your fasted, fastest method to get into the plant's system. So liquids, the plant's gonna be able to eat up or digest just like it would water, right? So your watering uh, is gonna basically get that activated. Whereas a granular is gonna be a slower release, right? It's gotta break down into the soil before the plant can digest it. So liquids just tend to act a little bit faster, but uh, depending on how large your lawn is, this may not be the most cost effective option. Granular might be the better way to go, right? So we're gonna talk about two different types of uh, liquids and granulars. So there are foods, which are fertilizers, <coughs> excuse me, and then there are supplements which is um, more like a vitamin for the, for the plant, right? Is everybody familiar with the numbers on fertilizers, the one, two, three numbers? No, cool. Easiest way to remember them, I always tell everybody, don't go back to high school chemistry. Easiest way to remember them, leaves, blooms, roots, okay? So first number is for your leaves, second number for your blooms, third number for your roots. Keep it really, really simple. Of course, there's some variations, that's not a hard and fast rule, right? But generally speaking, leaves, blooms, roots. So when we look at a fertilizer for the lawn, we'll notice that this guy that has to grow by Medina is a 1248. Really feeding those leaves, really feeding those roots, right? That's what we want. Because our lawn doesn't flower, right? We love it too. We're gonna talk about some turf alternatives that will, but our standard lawns don't flower, right? So we don't need a lot in that middle number, right? So leaves, blooms, roots there. The other big one that we'll see used a lot is a molasses, a liquid molasses or a dried molasses. Super easy to use. It's great. Did you say, have you used it before? Yeah. Oh, did you? Great. Yeah. Super easy to use. It's easy. You put it in a sprayer, go, 
dried molasses, spread it thin. It is molasses. It smells like molasses, right? Um, your lawn will smell very nice for a little bit. Yes, exactly, totally. <laughs> yeah, it would be great if we could do it during like holiday season, right? Um, I want to say this guy's about two to three ounces. Yeah. So yeah, it's about two to three ounces for, let's see, sorry. Yeah, about two gallons. So about an ounce a gallon, right, roughly, give or take. Now, I usually do the molasses a little bit heavy. This is the one product that I usually go smidge heavy on. So I might do more like a two ounce to a gallon uh, when I'm using it in the lawn in that way, only because it is the lawn. She's, she's thirsty and she needs something, you know what I mean? Um, and this is liquid, so it's also gonna be acting a lot faster. Um, this basically what this is doing, the molasses is gonna kind of help jumpstart the soil. It's gonna help jumpstart all of those little organisms and it's gonna start immediately feeding the root system of the lawn. You want a good, strong, healthy root system to have a good, healthy lawn. If you've got something happening up top, unlike most plants, it's only root, uh, root issue. With our plants, we can have something happening with the foliage and not with the roots, but with lawn, that's not really true. It's basically all about our roots, right? So we really wanna stay focused on that. So before I get in the weeds there, sorry, supplements versus foods, right? We want to feed a healthy lawn, okay? So once we've got our lawn and it's healthy, that's when our fertilizers are gonna come in. But when we're repairing or we're prepping the lawn, that's where our supplements are gonna come in, okay? So early in the season, we're gonna go heavy on supplements. So liquid seaweeds, the molasses, uh, things of that nature are gonna be where it's at for uh, early season, getting it prepped. We wanna jumpstart the soil. We wanna jumpstart the roots, okay? That's where this is gonna start. Then, once we've mowed for the second time in the season, okay, every season that changes, every time you mow for the second time, that's when you're gonna start fertilizing, okay? Fertilizer can always, the, the biggest waste in our industry is lawn fertilizing, okay? I will also tell you for the lawn, there is no such thing as weed and feed in our area. It does not exist. You don't treat weeds and feed your lawn at the same time, okay? That product only works in the northern part of the United States where everything is blooming and growing at the exact same time because it's coming out of winter and it's coming out of hibernation. We don't have that in our area. Our weeds start in February range for the spring, in September range for the fall, and then our lawn does not actually start growing until we have consistently warm weather, which tends to be mid to late March and then mid to late October in the fall, okay? So we do not have the same season for both of those products. So if you've got some weed and feed at home, get rid of it because you're basically wasting it. And what that's gonna cause is when you've got your thatch, that's gonna cause a lot of your fungal issues because there's nothing to digest one side or other of that product, okay? So those are always gonna be two different applications in our area. But our supplements like seaweeds and molasses, usually you're gonna start right as you, need, you notice your lawn starting to grow for the season, right? So typically early March. I'm not gonna fertilize though until late March or early April when I've mowed for the second time. The reason that we use that general rule of thumb of mowing for the second time is because that's when we know the lawn is actually producing and digesting what's left over in the soil from the year previous, okay? That's when the lawn needs food. We wake up in the morning, we do our little routine, we get up, and then we eat breakfast, right? We don't go straight from the bed to breakfast kind of concept, right? Yeah, well, I mean, there are those days, girl, I'm with you. But most of the time, right, we have to let our bodies wake up. It's kind of the same concept for our plants, right? They need to kind of wake up for the season first before they can start digesting. So if we put down fertilizer too early, it's not gonna hurt the lawn, but it is definitely going to get wasted, okay? Other supplements that are really amazing and wonderful that I put down with my compost are gonna be these two MicroLife ones. So there is a Humates, and there's what they call their bioinoculates. These two are amazing. I keep these two products around and I use them in all my potted plants also. The Humates, you'll notice this is 004, right? So we're just feeding roots. This is basically just a concentrated compost. I put this down when I'm doing my compost layer, right? This is also a granular, we'll notice. So this is gonna be a, a, a slower release, right? So I'm gonna get the immediate out of my liquid seaweeds and my, my liquid molasses, right? But I'm gonna get the slow release out of the Humates over here. The bioinoculates, let's see, the way they basically describe this on here, 63 different species of ben beneficial bacteria. That's a lot for this little jug, right? So you're kind of doing everything well-rounded with this guy. This is more of a vitamin, 
even than the humates would be, right? This has got a little bit of a food in the way that it's a basically a compost. Okay, compost can be seen as a food in that way, but both of these are gonna be really great to put out at the time you're doing your compost. Let these guys fall into the little holes that we just created with our aeration to feed the soil as well. The bioinoculate is mostly feeding soils, okay? But you'll notice they label it for lawn because it's a really easy, great application for the lawn. A granular too is not gonna be reaching super deep unless we mix it in, but thankfully our, our turf, turf roots are very shallow, right? So very effective. Same with our liquids when we're using the spray bottles, like this guy, super easy, hook it up to the hose and go as a fertilizer, right? You're, they're not penetrating super deep, but for our turf, that's perfect because we don't have a very deep root system, okay? Any big questions on supplements versus fertilizers? All good there? Yes? When you are applying like, fertilizers and supplements to your lawn, yeah. do you, uh, do you, because we're adding so many more things, mm -hmm. yeah. Bugs, did you say? Yeah. Um, yes and no. Um, n not measurable, right? Not that I would care about, but the plants are going to see some. Um, and what it, all I mean by that is you're basically activating the small ecosystem within the soil by doing all of this, but most of the time you're activating all the beneficial ones, so it's only good, right? Um, you're not necessarily worried, you're not stressing the plant by using a supplement, um, where you can stress a plant by fertilizing out of season, kind of forcing it to grow when it shouldn't be, that's when a, a kind of a, a bad bug could become a problem. Um, but most of the time, if you're doing it in the right season, you're, ben you're doing more benefit than you are harm in that way. So most of the time, any bugs you're attracting are typically the good ones, right? Or activating those micro microorganisms, right? Yeah, so most of the time, good ones in that way. Yep. The more microorganisms you can activate too, we've got so many awesome native species in that way that can really help with things like grubs too, right? So keeping your soil as active as possible, they will kind of as a natural defense, right? Um, one product I don't have because it's too warm is the, um, the I am drawing blanks today, guys. Um, it'll come to me. They're in the fridge. They are a bunch of little bugs that help eat off the bad bugs. Nematodes, thank you. Wow, wow, today. Uh, yeah, nematodes though. So nematodes are another really good beneficial bug to add into the lawn space specifically, but nematodes are great through all of your beds. So typically whenever I am using my nematodes, I'm kind of going from lawn into garden bed as I'm applying those. Um, really great way to get that ecosystem started in the lawn, right? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so we're gonna have um, uh, what you call like a, a hose end sprayer basically, okay? So similar to this guy where it's gonna hook up to the hose and spray out and then it's got the little jug that you screw in. Um, we've got two styles in the apothecary, a six gallon and a 20 gallon. I usually go the 20 gallon for my lawn stuff because it's just, you're going so much further, right? Um, and your lawn's a lot bigger. I usually use the six gallon just for my like bad bug treatment. Yeah, yeah, and then you can have a separation. Yes, ma'am. You're good. Yeah. So Okay, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Yep. That sounds like the right answer for the internet. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I would say I wouldn't go too heavy on sand if, if you're in your lawn area. And mostly because, again, remember our soils are so heavy in clay content. If you mix clay and cement, or uh, excuse me, clay and sand, you basically get cement, right? So I try to avoid too much heavy on the sand. Now there are some good um, agricultural sands that are good for the lawn. Green sand is another good one, right? Um, but you wouldn't do a straight green sand in that example. Um, we have a product by the ground up, they're out of Houston, called Bed Mix, actually, and it is actually a really healthy top dress uh, in that way as well. So you could totally use that as a good base layer, and then when you come to do your compost and such through the lawn, just go right over top of that, right? Um, and that'll help get the, kind of the, again, ecosystem jump started. Um, that way you're getting some good root development in there. Um, you don't want to go too heavy on just a straight compost when you go to do your top dress, because the compost, again, remember that thick, is just going to cause burn and it's going to be a couple years before that grows back. So yeah, you want something with a bed mix that's got a little bit more of a balanced mixture. Um, and the bed mix has got a little bit of loam in it, but again, it's more for texture, right? It's got the, the sands 
um, the agricultural sand, so it's got some like green sand and stuff in it. And then it does have, I want to say that mixture's about 25%, but don't mark me on that one. We can go check the bag. Um, but 25% uh, compost in it. I wasn't sure if I had it here or not. Um, but that would be a great kind of divot or hole filler uh, for the lawn, for sure. Yep. Yeah. We sure do. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just ask the cashiers for it and we'll get you loaded on it. Um, and they're, I think, one cubic or one and a half cubic foot bags. Yeah. Any other big questions there? Doing good so far? All right, so let's talk a little bit about water real quick. When we come to watering, the biggest thing you will always hear everybody say is don't waste it, right? Um, we, are, we, are, we are getting full right now with the rains we're getting, so let's be really conservative, right? All that really means is use it wisely, right? We want to use water where it's going to be m the most impactful. Um, so what we want to do is these, I've got some example photos here of kind of the best uh, application methods in the way of watering and we'll talk through each but not wasting it before 8 a.m. is best right that's gonna give it time to settle into the soil and the plant drink it and use it before it evaporates right so before 8 a.m. is the best if you can get up in the morning and do it if not past about 7 7 30 is a little is fine as well that's kind of the next best option right so if you are you know you head out early for for work and such and you can only water in the evening try to just get it past that like 7 7 30 mark um, and everybody's space is a little bit different so if you're in blasting sun still and getting that like evening sun at seven o'clock as it comes across right wait a little bit longer but the big thing is is you want to not water too late in the evening also right because if we're watering too late what's going to happen is the plant's not going to have uh, it's going to drink the water and but the water is going to sit on the foliage that's where we're also going to see fungal issues again right so we want to give the water time any excess to evaporate and saturate into the soil uh, before it gets too late basically watering too frequently if we water too frequent or too short of a time period, we can cause our lawn to have shallower roots, okay? So when you think about taking a bucket and just sprinkling it really quickly with water, you're only gonna water the surface about, what, maybe half an inch or so of water. What that's going to do is train the plant that instead of growing roots downward, uh, you know, four to six inches where we want them, it's gonna think, okay, my water is always only at the surface level. So it's gonna naturally develop shorter roots. But by developing shorter roots, we're not going to have as strong of a plant, meaning disease, bug, and water threat are going to be at a higher risk, right? So instead, I encourage everybody to water their lawn for what feels like a crazy amount of time every time you water and do it less frequently, okay? Because we do want the water, or excuse me, the soil to dry out in between still. So when I do water my lawn, which I will say I, I don't water my lawn, but when I did and I had, um, a, I have a small patch of kind of a St. Augustine mix um, out front. I've got a, a, like a 400 year old oak tree in my yard. It's beautiful. Um, but underneath that is some St. Aug. She's beautiful, looks great. I am mostly watering for my oak tree at that point. But the benefit is the lawn also likes that water, right? It takes me about 45 minutes to water my lawn out there, okay? So I've got a hose in my hand and I'm out there and it takes me about 45 minutes. So, so I'm implementing this method right here, right? The reason it takes me 45 minutes is because I do one whole pass, give it a second, and then I basically come back, okay? Once you've done your first pass, what you're doing is you're kind of prepping the, lawn, the soil level, right? It absorbs it. Now any extra water can actually start to penetrate and go through deeper, right? So we always see that in our rains. If we get a little bit of a sprinkle before a heavy rain, we don't actually see a lot of flooding. If we only get that heavy rain, right, we see a lot of flooding. Our clay just can't absorb the water fast enough as it's coming down. So watering as a secondary pass is actually gonna be really, really beneficial to keep, get that really deep soak, okay? Honestly, that goes for your perennial beds too, so you can apply that same method there. But basically, you wanna get it as deep as possible. We wanna train our grass to grow the deepest roots it possibly can, okay? So the deeper and slower we can saturate the soil, the better. Um, watering in the middle of the day, even with a lot of these um, kind of automated sprinklers or semi-automated sprinklers is horrible. Remember, water is like a magnifying glass. Those little beads of water sitting on any foliage is like a magnifying glass. The other downfall is all of these guys are shooting water up into the air. 
if it is any bit windy, you're losing your water, and then you're also evaporating. Uh, it was the egg extension program that did a study a handful of years back. In all three of these types of watering, what they were finding is that if you watered, that's that whole 8 a.m. mark, right? If you're watering more in the middle of the day, you're actually losing as much as 40 to 50% of your water to evaporation uh, that quickly, right? So it is, it's intense, right? We don't wanna lose that water. Number one rule, don't waste it, right? Use it as wisely as you can. So if we are gonna implement these methods, we wanna go for a sprinkler that's gonna give us the biggest water drop it can, okay? There's a lot of the little, um, Sprinklers, they call this one Dad's Sprinkler or something like that is the name brand, right? I think we've got some red ones that are in the tool shed right now. They're really small. They're fantastic because they can fit in your pocket as you're working out in the yard kind of thing, right? So you, it's, it's a really great. They're usually solid metal, and you'll notice they've got really large holes on them. That is what we're after, right? We want something that's going to give us as big of a droplet as possible for two reasons. Bigger drops are not going to... Um, going to evaporate as quickly as it falls to the ground and it's going to be harder for the wind to blow it away right so we're not going to waste it a lot this more jet style stream we see these a lot used nowadays we also see the finger rotors we call them right where they kind of come up and there's four or five as they kind of pass over in an automated irrigation system this is what you want so if you're in an older home the old irrigation used to pop up with like a cone misting spray Oh, so terrible for the lawn, right? So if you ever have an opportunity and you can, definitely upgrade those rotors, right? Because that is where you're gonna get the most benefit. Again, the bigger the drop, the better. The faster it's gonna fall to the ground kind of concept, okay? These guys, these fan ones are really, really great, but there are some not so great ones where they've got multiple settings. And it's, it, what it's doing in that case is kind of restricting the flow. So usually the holes are smaller where the water can come out, okay? So I don't typically recommend this one unless it's one of those real, real, real basic ones without a bunch of the settings on it, okay? Dram is my one exception to this style. We carry a Dram one, it's like a big circle and it does have multiple selectors. But again, as you look at all those selectors, they're nice big holes. So just check out the equipment that you're using in the yard, right? Um, but these guys are great in the way that they can get a good reach for you. So just again, let's just always look at the equipment that we're using there. Um, the, I already covered those. Hosen. Uh, Hosen shower heads are the best. I'm a big fan of the Dram. They've got the water wand. They've got the big old rain shower heads on them, right? You're basically flooding the soil, and that's why I like to make two passes with those, right? I'm going to make one big pass to get that prep and that saturation to happen, and then my second is actually watering deep into the soil, okay? So we want to go as deep as possible, which is why all of these methods are going to be the ones with the biggest raindrops possible kind of concept, okay? We want that to come out and hit the ground as fast as it possibly can. Does anybody have automated irrigation with their lawn right now? Yeah. Oh, awesome. We've got a, quite a bit. Cool. Do you guys have a um, like a smart irrigation controller right now? Yeah. Are you using Rachio or the Rainbird. Bumble? Rainbird. Okay. Is it app connected or? It's an app and on. On the weather station? Well, um, well we have like a thing that detects. Yep. Okay, cool. Right. Love that. Yeah, you guys have the rain detectors and stuff too? Cool. So we, part, we partner with a group called Rachio. If anybody's heard of Rachio for the controllers, Rachio is a fully integrated smart system where it basically is only connecting to weather stations, but it's the same. They're new, whereas you know the Rainbirds are the irrigation controller, right? Um, and so instead of a small um, weather station, it's all app-based and you actually connect via Wi-Fi to all the other stations. And what's cool about Rachio is they will also, what do they call that, create a web together, right? So it also will talk to other ratios to say, hey, did you get some rain? I got some rain. This is how much I got. You know what I mean? So they're kind of talking to each other. But my point there is the rain sensors are really, really great when you've got this automated irrigation. So if you don't have one, that's another way to really upgrade that because it can help you understand when we get that little bit of rain, we might only penetrate a half an inch into the soil and your irrigation may still come on because we're telling the irrigation and when we program it, we want that deeper saturation, right? So it helps us just get a good understanding of how it is penetrating into our soils, okay? But again, we wanna promote as much deep root growth as possible. So usually what I tell people is you will do more harm if you don't have the 30 to 45 minutes to water than to try to water for 10 minutes. Right? It's more harmful to try to do that 10 minute water than just skip until you can get to a 45 minute watering kind of thing, right? So I would encourage everybody, I said don't be that person on here, right? Don't make me, don't make me come to your house if you're watering in the middle of the day. Um, but yeah, you really, you wanna, you wanna skip if you can't do it right. The lawn is really, really important for that space. 
our plants, our perennials, our natives, you know what, they don't mind a little drink, you know, so getting them a, a quick little 10 minute watering, fine, but make sure to come back to them, of course, to care for those babies. But our lawn is gonna be really important. And anytime you can only water and you only hit that half an inch, you are only promoting roots to stay shallow, right? We wanna water so that we're saturating down into the soil to create those longer roots. That's what's gonna create a much healthier lawn, okay? Any other big questions on water? All good? Yeah. Like first pass automated? Totally. So most of our automated guys may even start at like five or six AM. You know what I mean? To get through the full cycle, right? Um, yes, typically with a lawn, um, so on our uh, Native Edge is our landscape company. The way we set it as a standard there is we actually have uh, a, two, a two part run for all of our lawn, right? So the first one may, might only run like 15 minutes, and the next one will usually run 30 to 35 minutes. It kind of depends on your square footage, honestly. But I would say on average, anywhere from probably, you know, 15 to like 45 minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's not a whole lot of time, but it is usually enough time for another zone to run in between and then come back to it, right? So that way you're still saving that time to get your lawn in, or get all of your watering done, I should say, by 8 a.m., right? Yeah. Uh, all right, cool. So let's talk about turf as a label. So turf grasses are, are an actual label, that's fine. But turf, the idea of turf is more just a generalized label. The idea of a turf is to give us a green space that we can run in, play in, kids can have and enjoy, right? The dogs can have and enjoy. Does it mean have kiddos or dogs at home that they use the lawn space for? Yeah, cool. So there's some really cool alternatives to those that you don't need to put up as much of a fight, right? Um, and all I mean by that is the lawn is a resource hog. So in the idea that you have to do these supplements and fertilizers every year, and then as you're going through the season, you're typically using them every two to four weeks, right? I mean, it is, your reapplication is a lot with these. So with a turf alternative, <clears throat> the idea here is that you can have these green spaces with other plants other plants that naturally have deeper root systems, 8, 10, 12, 14 inches deep, right? So it's also going to become a lot more drought tolerant. Uh, this here is a creeping thyme in between a patio space. This is a native sedge. I don't, uh, if anybody's gone kind of like hiking on the hike and bike trails, kind of on the west side, right? You see sedge, little tufts of sedge everywhere, right? It makes a beautiful lawn. Silver Pony's foot, everybody's favorite. This can handle some foot traffic, not heavy foot traffic. So if we've got dogs or kids, probably not the most perfect for their play space. But sedge is amazing. It is gonna be naturally longer though. So when we look at these, we might need to change our kind of our perceived value of what the lawn itself looks like in the way that this guy here is probably anywhere from four to six inches long and it needs to stay that four to six inches long, right? In order to be super healthy. I've got a section of my backyard that is just sedge, just like this. I had the benefit of moving in uh, my property back to a creek and so there was already just naturally it was growing. So I just encouraged its growth growth, excuse me, so I mow the rest, and then I change my mower, set it on a six inch setting, and that's where I mow the sedge at, right? And then I still get this beautiful lawn. My dogs prefer that space because it's a little longer and softer, right? Um, but there's different things that we can use. So a lot of us also are familiar with the horse herb. That's that one with the little yellow flower, kind of small heart-shaped leaf. It pops up in our lawns whether we want it to or not, right? Um, but that's a really great turf alternative. It's growing there because it doesn't mind the foot traffic right? A plant's not going to just sprout out randomly if it can't handle it, right? So it's growing in these areas because it can handle it. Frog fruit's another really awesome aggressive one. It is going to be a little bit longer though. Frog fruit's going to be that six to eight inch height kind of thing, right? Um, but it is super aggressive. It's like a Bermuda, which we love, right? Because you're not going to kill it. You can run and rampage on it and it's not going to die. She's going to look beautiful the next day. Another thing with the frog fruit is they shoot up these beautiful little clusters of white flowers a lawn that could bloom. How awesome is that, right? Uh, we talked about the sedge, the silver pony foot, thyme in this example, sedums and woolly stomodias, super drought tolerant. Not a ton of foot traffic for those two varieties, right? But maybe a front lawn is a good space for those, right? Um, the little, what we call the hell strip, right? Between our sidewalks and the curbs out front, great place for this stuff, right? Because these guys want that radiant heat. Um, and then buffalo grass, that's gonna look very similar to the sedge, but also would be another great place. Um, but yeah, that hell strip, frog fruit, horse herb, all those kinds of things give that lawn appearance and aesthetic and the idea of kind of a flat, uniform surface 
but aren't going to be a turf grass where you're going to need to mow and you're going to need to aerate and you're going to need to compost and you're going to need to supplement and you're going to need to feed it, right? So all of those things come in handy when we're looking at these different perennials because now we don't have to do all that, right? Once they're established, we kind of let them do their thing. Um, when we're talking about fertilizer, so let's, let's hit on the kind of the difference here. Turf is going to be a heavy feeder, okay? So our turf grasses, Bermudas, St. Augs, uh, Zoysias, Buffalo, all of them are going to be heavy feeders. There are turf foods and granulars. So we've got uh, two, two um, styles, if you will, from Nature's Creation here, a company out of San Antonio. This is going to be a 422. This guy's going to be a 612. This has also got the mycorrhizae in each of these. The mycorrhizae is another beneficial bacteria. That's going to be one of the many beneficial bacteria in the bioinoculates for microlife here. But every lawn is going to need food. Typically, you're going to be fertilizing your lawn every two to three weeks in its growing season. So basically, March through end of May, June range, right? Uh, this year, definitely June because of the weather we're getting. She's going to keep growing. And then in the fall, we're typically doing it all through end of September through November, right? It is a lot of fertilizer. The benefits of a, of a turf alternative lawn is you fertilize this maybe what, once every four to six weeks you know, to do your perennial beds. So that's why we also look at turf alternative options uh, when it comes to the landscape. Uh, granulars are a little bit slower release, uh, which is great, but because our roots are so shallow, remember with the turf grass, they get used pretty quickly, right? So the nutrient is not always uh, as readily available uh, because the roots are shallow, right? Whereas like a perennial space like this, where we're using some of the turf alternatives, they've got the deeper root system, they can handle that in between a little bit better, right? A lot of wasted uh, fertilizers, and this is why we always talk about that second time of mowing. If you're using a fertilizer and it's getting wasted, meaning the plant doesn't need it yet kind of concept, right? That's what leaches into our aquifers and causes all those extra algae buildups and things of that nature, right? So we don't want to be gross. So let's keep those nice and clean. And that's why we want to make sure we're fertilizing in the right season for that reason, OK? Uh, let's see. Any big questions on turf alternatives? Yes? Yeah, yeah. Totally. Yep. So Big. Totally. Yep. Uh, especially if you're just if you're wanting to if you're wanting to encourage its further growth, right? Yep. Uh, so it will benefit from that. Now the benefit is you're not going to have to do that every year, right? Whereas the turf, you're going to get that thatch buildup, and that's where you need that compost because all that fungal it doesn't have oxygen, all of that, right? Um, whereas something that's more perennial like the horse herb won't require that every year. Would it like it? Of course it would, right? But it's definitely not as necessary for sure. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. For those types of uh, turf, mm -hmm. how often do you say uh, for fertilizing? So for fertilizing for your perennial beds, typically you're looking at every like four to six weeks on a granular, right? Compared to the lawn, which is about half that. Yeah. Lawns are definitely hungrier, right? Because again, it just comes down to the shallow root system, right? They've got a shallower root; they can't get to as much. Uh, nutrients that we do have available in our soils, uh, but they just can't get to it, right? So when we're using per more perennial style material, naturally they just have, and natives, naturally they just have a deeper root system. So they've got more access to nutrients available to them. Um, our clays actually have, our clay soil actually has a lot of really great nutrients, uh, but we have to release it basically, and that's where the compost really helps. P pretty much all, yeah, pretty much all the ones I've listed here, I would take sedum and woolly stomodia out of that, though. Okay. But everything else, horse herb does totally fine. Um, sedge is amazing. Um, I'm not, like I said, my dogs prefer the sedge, so they're doing all their business on the sedge over there. How do you find the poo in there? <laughs> it is a little bit more difficult. You're going a little bit more native with that. Um, but yeah, that is, it is a little bit tricky, um, especially if you let it grow out to a space like this. Yeah, like I said, I usually mow mine to a six inch height and it's not too, too bad. Um, and I've got a medium sized dog, so, you know, they're doing their business over there. But yeah, it's, it's not too, too bad. Um, but it is definitely a different perspective, right? You know, we're, we're, we're going from the what was to something new. Yeah, so it is just, it's a different approach, right? Um, but yeah, it's not... 
again, using it in like a front yard, even when we've got kids and dogs, maybe that's the area for something like this, right? And then you have your standard turf grass in the back. You could still kind of do your part by at least reducing some of that on your property, right? Um, front yards are usually where we see this used the most, right? Because they tend to be the, the least personalized spaces on our property, right? Meaning we're not usually out in them as much as maybe the backyard per se, right? Especially with the kids and dogs, right? We can just let them run in the fence. <laughs> So dog spots are going to be always really tricky. So you basically, the, the, there's a couple of ways to, to battle that, but the most effective is unfortunately watering it as soon as they go. Yeah. Um, there are supplements like a, um, there's like a, um, some sulfurs and such, and we can kind of talk about how to mix those after class because that gets a, a little bit specific, and I don't know if it's as um, effective as it should be. Um, but the best practice, honestly, is water. Rinse it down. Um, a lot of folks I know will just keep, uh, like, a, the, you, like your watering can, right? And just, hey, they went out and did their business, just kind of go rinse as best you can. Yeah. Yep. Now, I will say the benefit of a lot of these perennials is they're going to have broader leaves and they're taller. So when we run into the idea of the, the urine spots from the dogs, the urine is actually reaching the soil level when we're using some perennial material, right? So you don't typically see those as much. Yep. Um, a healthier lawn can also battle dog urine a lot better, too. I will say that. Because that, that thatch layer is where that's, that's affecting it the most. If you're wanting to go from, like, Bermuda to one of these, yeah. Just, yeah, burn the whole neighborhood down uh, and then start it. Yep, uh huh, yep, yep, yeah, yeah. But you'll have a beautiful lawn at the end of it, right? Yeah, uh huh. No, usually with Bermuda, I like to solarize. It's the most cost effective. You have to be a little bit patient. Um, but basically, what I'll do is I'll lay out some cardboard, right? It's um, not like a. Um, uh, not like a cereal box with all the extra inks and stuff. It's as simple of a, a cardboard as you can find. Kind of lay out a layer of that, put thick plastic right on top of it, black or clear is fine in this case. Uh, weigh it down and you will kill off that section in a few weeks, especially in weather like this. Yep. You have to be a little bit patient because you have to wait for it to kill it off. Um, it is not fully dead once the foliage looks dead. Give it like two more weeks to kill out, finish the roots, right? The reason for the cardboard, though, is it's suffocating it, and then you're just going to mix that into the soil as you plant your new. Yep. Yeah, Bermuda's pretty aggressive because of that deep root system. Yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, if you've got any exposed roots, so, uh, so as your trunk comes down and has that little bit of root flare right before it hits the soil, any of those exposed roots that are coming out laterally are there for oxygen. So do try to avoid those the best you can. Um, but yeah, if, if you don't have that happening, you know, you've got a relatively healthy tree happening there kind of concept, go right around, you're fine. Yep. Just don't build up on, on the trunk itself, of course. Yep, yep, yep. Oh. Any other big questions on turf alternatives? All good on those guys? I think that, yeah, that is my last slide. Um, do you guys, what didn't we hit on today? Anybody have any other questions? Yes, please. So, there's a little puzzle issue that we're missing mushrooms. No, actually, mu mushrooms are a really great sign. We get that question a lot right now. So, we have so many mushrooms popping up everywhere right now because of the amount of rain and humidity and overcast weather we've had, okay? Mushrooms are actually a great sign of healthy soil. So a lot of people tend to worry. If you have a plant that's affected, that's different. But if you're, if you're generally green around it, it's all green. then it's actually just a sign of really healthy soil. Okay. Yep. Mushrooms are always scary to see, yep. So we don't nope. Nope. Mushrooms usually, too, are, are natives like spores and stuff that pop. They only last a day or two. Um, most of ours are not, but I would, I would definitely be sure to do your research. Um, yeah, you can, just, you can just pluck them right out. I usually just step on them as I'm walking around my lawn just to, just to squish them down kind of thing, just because they're not cute. Um, but yeah, you, usually a mushroom, uh, as long as, like I said, you're green around and you're not seeing like yellowing or browning or tip burns, you know, stuff like that, um, is actually just a good, healthy lawn or uh, soil. Yeah. So 
soil's probably in good shape. You also did yours last year. You know, if so yeah, in those spaces, I, would, I don't know if I'd worry about it too, too much this year, but definitely next year, right? Yeah, you don't want that layer building up too, too much. Yeah, for sure. Any other big questions that we didn't hit on today? Yes. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So that's going to be really great for like your trees, flower beds, stuff like that, because it's going to be a little bit chunkier, okay? What we want when we're looking at a compost is something that's going to tell us that it's been a screened compost. Um, so you'll see typically it's going to be in the like description area here. This says screened to three quarter inch minus times two. This is going to be a very thin compost, okay? It's very fine in texture. That's what we want for our lawn space, okay? The chunky stuff is still really, really good, and usually what I lean towards when I'm going to do my perennial beds, my trees, shrubs like that, because the chunkier, the more air I'm going to be able to maintain in the soil as it breaks down. Yep. I have this one patch of grass that continues to grow as crabgrass. Yeah, I love that. Yep. It made the grass around it a lot healthier, but it also like tripled the size of, of course. the crabgrass Of Yes, area. yeah, because it's eating the same thing. Yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. How do you recommend getting rid of the crabgrass without hurting the soil and uh, all that stuff? Best way would be to literally dig it out um, without causing as little harm as possible. I will say we do have a little shaker of crabgrass. It is not organic, but it is basically the only product that will take care of it. Um, best way to handle crabgrass though is literally just dig out the section and then the bed mix I was mentioning earlier, I would just fill in with that. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, usually, and crabgrass has got some deep roots. So make sure to really prep for that for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. No, right now is your growing season again because of the temperature, right? And the amount of rain that we've been getting. So this year, realistically, you will probably fertilize your lawn all the way through the end of June, honestly. Even the long-term photo. Yeah, exactly, yep. We're, and the only reason we're going to take that summer break is we don't want to promote growth when it's going to need the most w water, right? Yeah, yep. Um, another question uh, that we get a lot, too, with the weed concept is how do I best prevent the weeds? There are pre-emergence, and that's great, and that's awesome. A healthy lawn will take care of the weeds for you, though. Lawn is dense. There's not a lot that can really realistically grow through it. So if you make your lawn healthier, you will naturally see less weeds too. Yes, absolutely. Uh huh. So that's going to depend on your variety and what you want to achieve in the lawn. To be honest. Okay. Yep. So overseeding will help when seasons like the winter and dead of summer, uh, when, it's, when it's dry, dead of summer. So kind of like last year, we saw a lot of our Bermudas kind of brown out on us a little bit. It goes a little bit dormant, but that's a perfect opportunity for volunteers, right? Because the lawn isn't growing really well. So you overseed typically with a seasonal grass. Mostly what we use in our area is rye, right? Um, so a lot of folks will use the rye, especially in winter, because it's a thick bladed grass. And that will prevent all your, 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 um, seeds your weed seeds from dropping and germinating because again it's not getting any light right so our lawns can either go dormant in winter or summer and the reason that we do our pre-emergence in february and september uh same kind of time year that we're, we're starting our fertilizers too right is because our seeds are falling so from when uh, from excuse me from our fall weeds that are growing they do their blooming they drop their seed in the winter and then by february they're usually all on the ground and that's why we put down the pre-emergent to kind of coat them right to keep them away but that's the season that they're dropping right so if you have something like a winter rye growing uh, over your winter season you're typically preventing any sun from getting to the seed allowing it to germinate the downfall with with overseeding is we have a fairly neutral climate so even your winter and summer rise can still love the next season. And so what can happen is because they're naturally an aggressive grower, uh, because they're just a seasonal grass, you can also overshadow the lawn that you want. Yep. So that's kind of the trade-off and it's a little bit tricky. Um, I am not personally a huge fan of the overseeding. It's not to say it's the wrong method, right? Um, but I am just not personally a, a fan for that reason. 
I would much prefer just hit the pre-emergent in February. That's like a corn gluten, right? Um, and hit it again in September. And I would rather more of a dormant lawn, right? But my yard is definitely, it definitely leans more on the native side, right? In what we were looking at there. So it definitely is a personal preference. If we've got a pristine lawn and we want it seasonally, rye is gonna be your best friend. There's nothing wrong environmentally with rye. Uh, you're gonna uh, water in a season that you didn't normally water, but that's about it. Yeah. And you're gonna mow too in a season that you're not normally mowing. So there is quite a bit of mowing. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Good job. You got this. You got this. Is it a push mower or a riding push? Cool. A little bit more control on a push mower at least. Yeah. Any other big questions, guys, that we didn't hit on today? All good? I love it. We've covered all the super basics. You guys are always welcome to come and bring us in samples. Feel free to pluck some grass out of the lawn kind of thing and bring it in if you're worried about something not looking right. Pictures are always our friend. I always suggest up close and then get us a kind of a step back photo too, right? So we can kind of see what's happening around the space just in case we notice something environmental that maybe you didn't realize is a factor kind of concept, right? So having both an up close to see the what's happening and kind of stepping back so we can see the space is always really helpful on our side to help you guys diagnose. But you guys are always welcome to bring us in photos because it's samples, any of it. We are always happy to kind of talk through all the products today. Um, everything here is available. So if you guys need some of these goodies today, please feel free to grab them on your way out. And I did want to remind everybody that we've got the Memorial Weekend sale going on. Fountains, pottery, statuary, benches, furniture kind of stuff out there all on sale. Everything is at least 10%. Uh, and then the colored dots tell you if it's additional markdown kind of thing. So if you guys have any questions today, come and see us. And I have got everybody's $10 coupon from class today. So make sure to see me on your way out. Thank you guys very much. <laughs>